हाय गिरीश या हाय हाय या हाय हाय ओके यू नेटवर्क इज अ प्रॉब्लम ऑल राइट विल कंटिन्यू आवर डिस्कशन ऑन व्हाट आई हैव पिक्ड अप वाइल स्टडिंग भारतीय दर्शन नाउ a couple of things i i want to mention here like what motivated me i spoke in the beginning uh in the first uh, episode now a uh, couple of more things um uh, i want to mention here one of the things actually even i talked about how in 92 93 i started looking seriously at uh, indian darshanas but the trigger for that came actually uh, around 85 when uh, i read a book by uh, hardial bains a canadian uh, uh, marxist um he had written about what was at that time uh, what was happening in punjab and he was analyzing the indian economy indian politics uh, post independence what all has happened and what is um happening in punjab etc uh, and number of topics he covered in that book it is a small book but it covered uh, uh, a lot of things and uh, it is quite uh, revealing in many ways uh, i had not seen a book on india like that uh, before by any indian marxist um or anybody else uh, you know uh, and one of the things it uh, uh, talked about is the um bhakti uh, bhakti uh, tradition in india and uh, of course he 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 brought it in to discuss the, a bit of history of sikhism etc because the topic was uh, punjab but he made much broader points uh, on the bhakti uh, tradition uh, in india and uh, for the first time i heard somebody especially um, uh, make this kind of an analysis saying that bhakti um, for various reasons he analyzed it he especially took the you can say what is what we now call later bhakti that is 15th 16th century that is nana kabir uh, you know mira etc um, whereas we know that actually bhakti um, tradition started around 7th 8th century in tamil nadu uh, then later um, uh, in karnataka then uh, maharashtra and so on 12th century 13th century 12th in karnataka 13th in naneshwar in uh, 12th century was uh, this lingayat basavanna and all that and then in 13th century with nandev in uh, maharashtra etc and so on and then again uh so but what he pointed out is this came up again and again in different regions okay and uh, from uh, many many parts of india in different centuries but uh, basically um, it uh, articulated radical democratic uh, um, uh, aspirations but in a spiritual cover okay the spiritual shell and he called it as a part of the india's movement for secularization and he discussed at length about uh, the difference between secularism and movement for secularization and all that that was all very interesting um, so it since i i was somewhat familiar only with uh, the lingayat uh, vachanakaras of 12th century in karnataka um so this uh, created interest in interest in me to study look at bhakti um you know to see um what were its aspects and why did it come up in different uh, places at different times and what were its impact social impact uh, or did it have any impact on the politics and the economics and so on and so forth okay so that was in fact that has been uh, one of my uh you can say projects uh, since uh, 85 86 when i was first read his book uh, to 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 think about that and to sort of um, uh, study that though i have not been able to do a comprehensive study of that I just studied here and there um and 
that is one thing then second thing also um somewhere in the early 90s he also there was another i think um uh talk by him or an article by him um where he was talking about indian philosophy uh and he mentioned he quoted marx saying that um we need to settle accounts with our intellectual conscience our intellectual heritage okay so marx said that is uh, with respect to his european philosophical traditions and particularly german philosophical tradition and so on that means settling accounts means studying and 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 uh, and um, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, critically studying your own intellectual uh, and philosophical tradition okay uh, now that was also quite uh, provocative because um, i found myself uh, in a situation in which uh, i am sure there are many modern uh, indians in modern india who who find that they are not european uh they are influenced by european science they are, do not know much about european philosophy we do not know i do not know much about european philosophy neither the greek or the german or the english and uh, uh, french and so on um and uh, neither do we know much about uh, the indian philosophy okay um indian darshanik tradition and all that so culturally we are very indian but we have not uh, I, i mean i don't have a um, uh, an understanding of the what are the indian uh, traditions uh, you know intellectual traditions or darshanas as it is called in india whereas in the west in greek uh, greece and all they called it philosophy philosophy means um, you know love of wisdom okay love of knowledge and so on uh, whereas darshana is a very different uh, approach um, and uh, it's that way it is not philosophy it is uh, though it is generally equated with philosophy but darshana actually means a revelation and some people look at it saying that darshana could be something you know jaise bolte hai na bhagwan ka darshan you know uh, so some revelation of that sort but uh, it could it can also mean how the world reveals itself to us okay so what is our interaction with the world and how how the world reveals itself to us and how do we uh, understand it and so on now other thing is that uh, um the indian darshanik traditions at least as we know them now uh actually have social and moral aims okay which is that uh that studying of these darshanas should should uh, should uh, uh, you know uh, create a dif- different human being um uh, and and so on as more a transformative uh, aspects to it that uh, in your life in your morality etc etc which like uh, philosophy is not supposed to i mean the western style of philosophy is just you know uh, is it is uh, um, uh, you can say that way you can say more uh, dry i mean it doesn't have any ethical ethics is considered as a separate subject okay and not a uh, philosophy in general is how we look at the world what is your world outlook how do you gain knowledge about this world you know and and so on um uh, how do you uh, generalize uh, the, from the uh, everyday experience mundane experiences or everyday experiences how do you generalize and uh, how do you look at uh, uh, you know the, the world itself okay and how do you interact with world how do you interact with other brains other human beings etc etc okay world outlook what is called world outlook um but here darshana seems to have in in the indian tradition much more uh, of a spiritual metaphysical angle as well uh, and uh, they even talk about salvation as one of the goals of these darshanas okay and overcoming overcoming the limitations of this um uh they they look at 
um, the um, many um, you know they, they they look at this world uh, not giving uh, a permanent uh, sukha they want permanent sukha so not just happiness but permanent happiness and so on so they say then they say that all material things do not give you permanent happiness they just give you instant happiness or a short term happiness and so to permanent happiness now you'll have to uh, uh, they get into metaphysics uh, uh, in the search for permanent happiness uh, which they'll call as salvation moksha etc etc okay um so darshana has 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 actually the goal of darshana uh though they say normally that uh, in the indian tradition that the goal of darshana is both abhyudaya and nishreyas abhyudaya means um, material progress uh, and nishreyas means moksha okay salvation and so on so um now and that path to salvation through all these different darshanas basically requires uh, uh understanding of the of the transitory nature of material happiness material goods and and uh, uh, progressively detaching yourself from the material world in a sense renouncing the material world or transcending the material world and so on and so forth okay so that looks very um, that might appeal to a few people um depending on their um, state of mind and depending on their uh, age etc but whereas a vast majority of the people uh, would be more um, uh, drawn towards abhidaya um, they have to look after their family they have to look after themselves they have to earn a living they have to be socially productive uh, and so on and so forth so if uh, a particular way of looking at things particular way of analyzing uh, your experiences etc and coming to conclusions helps them in that abhyudaya in their material uh, progress then uh, obviously uh, you know they will take it as a, a very um, essential part of their uh, training uh, uh, their intellectual training and so on so even if it is difficult even if they have to um uh, you know dedicate uh, uh, you know certain part of their life for a serious study of that uh, and practicing that and so on they would be ready to do it because it is going to lead to abhidaya it is just like you know i want to study math or i want to study physics or i want to study engineering uh, why do i want to study that because we can say it's interesting but more than that it will give me a job it will um, give me a, a well earning job and so on so forth right so that is abhi there so if so uh, but this part uh, they just assume that you know it is there but it is it's really transient and all that so this is one of the problems uh, i find uh, that uh, why uh, while there is a lot of rich thought in the bhartiya darshanas that uh, it doesn't uh, attract uh, youth uh you know mass of the youth i mean you you have exceptions there are some people at a very young age uh, get interested in uh, philosophy and so on um oh. but uh, most young people would like uh, to get involved in uh, in uh, in education in enterprise which will lead them to uh, more material progress okay um and which will give them fulfillment in the form of being more and more productive and socially productive person um and not a parasite not a dependent on other people and so on so forth they they grow in confidence that i'm i'm productive and society values my uh, contribution and and uh, and so on so forth okay their self esteem also increases um and um but uh, anyway leaving that aside uh the other um, uh, but it is i think uh, we need to study at least i thought that i need to uh, you know uh, from for a long time uh, probably from my childhood but uh, at least since my adult life 
I have been an atheist. I have not practiced any uh, religion or not, not any kind of ritual um, and so on. And uh, um, while I have you know, no problem with somebody else uh, practicing them, but I have not found it uh, useful or necessary for my uh, way of life or my thinking. Um, and that is... Uh, um, um, but... I, I I see the influence of these rituals, ritual as part of life or uh, theism as part of life, theism as part of a belief system of people, uh, of all people around me, uh, people with whom I interact as, as colleagues, as, uh, you know, in the organizations, in the offices and, you know, in ordinary life, in social life. Uh, so uh, that issue of uh, theism and atheism Belief in ritual, not belief in ritual is just, um, you can say, a matter of personal, personal choice. As long as you're good neighbors, you're good uh, human beings, uh, you're good citizens, uh, you have empathy towards others' uh, problems and suffering, and you try to help them uh, going out of your way, uh, that you'll keep your self-interest uh, uh, aside to help somebody else. You know what we normally call a good human beings, right? So as long as uh, um, you know you are a good human being, a good social being, uh, the rest of those uh, beliefs, philosophical beliefs, which can even change in a person over a period of time, depending on their experiences, etc., is is there? Uh, there is what is called right to conscience. In fact, the Renaissance, this issue came up, and uh, in fact, one of the features of bhakti is also right to conscience. That um, that you can believe what you want to believe. I mean, you can. Uh, in fact, Bhaktas expressed it in the form of saying that you know I will worship my God the way I like. You know, not necessarily the way some priest uh, says or some religious book says or some you have to go to some particular place to do it uh, and so on. But uh, you know, I can do it where I want, the way I want, and it's a it's a it's a it's a private matter between me and my deity, me and my God, type of thing. Okay, um, that, so that is why it was called secularizing, a moment for secularization. That is that this belief or this communion with God or whatever you you want to call it, you want to call it meditation or communion with God or whatever, you have a right to do in the way you want. Okay, nobody else can impose their view or their method as the only method over you. Okay. So that kind of rigidity, uh, rigid imposition from somebody by a community or a certain uh, 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 segment within the community uh, uh, or even state power and so on cannot impose on you these kinds of, um, um, of uh, matters. Uh, so this was the Bhakta's uh, uh, way of uh, talking about it. And to an extent, even Sufis also uh, insisted on that and uh, all that. Um, and uh, um, this, so it was, um, um, these two things I should mention, that, that initial interest in bhakti as a secularization moment um, and uh, as, a, as a radical democratic, at least spiritual democracy, that everybody has a right, everybody is eligible to 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 attain uh, whatever they want to do in spiritual life. Whereas the older uh, systems had barred uh, various sections of peer society like uh, women and uh, uh, what they called as uh, shudras and uh, uh, what they called as lower caste away from these, uh, these kinds of uh, enlightenment. Okay, enlightenment through ritual. Um, so that the bhaktas had uh, rebelled against. Also, and they said there is a spiritual democracy. So these were, um, in in a sense, it struck me. I thought that maybe this was our Renaissance moment. Okay, just like in 14th, 15th, 16th century, you had Renaissance in uh, in Europe. Um, uh, you know, starting around Italy and then spreading to other places. Um, I thought that this bhakti was one. Uh, it was an Indian form of Renaissance. Um, but of course, the European Renaissance had its effects in many other ways. It was not just questioning certain things and uh, questioning the orthodoxy and then questioning the church and questioning the state power and 
questioning uh, rigidity in uh, society in the class society uh, and and uh, and so on not just that but here that was the european form which took so uh, that's why they call it as pre renaissance period as a dark ages okay where there was a, a total rigidity and uh, there is no uh, uh, right to conscience in a way and anybody who opposed the the church and the scriptures and all that were persecuted in different countries in different ways in uh, in those dark ages now uh, in india it took a probably took a different form and uh, and bhakti it struck me at that time as as something of that type uh, a secularization movement which kept aside uh, these matters as private okay and you are free to do the way you want and nobody can impose one way as the right way and so on and so forth okay so which is uh, which has been our tradition all along i mean in a sense the essence of our our uh, our uh, culture and society has been that of diversity and uh, uh, you know mutual respect for uh, different uh, approaches different thought uh, whether they are spiritual approaches or anything else and and particularly in spiritual and religious matters okay um and uh, even i mean uh, so it it really uh, there is no ground uh, on fighting with uh, other somebody else who has a different form of worship or different belief system as long as we are good social human beings uh, you know the the rest is all uh, private uh, you you can think the way you want and uh, Uh, nobody has a right to you can discuss you can uh, you can even have a friendly argument uh, and you can try to convince each other even uh, if uh, both sides are interested in that in that kind of a dialogue but you cannot impose it and uh, and definitely the state has no role in imposing that state or anybody else any other institution right so um, now let's um, uh, that is just uh, i i thought i should mention that now what i wanted to um, talk in this episode particularly is that how do we say something is true how do we say something is uh, correct okay uh, a statement now how do we verify whether a particular statement is correct a particular description is correct description of an event uh, and so on so now indian tradition in the indian tradition generally they say that a statement will need a, today we talk about evidence based science okay evidence based discussion etc right now precisely that 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 they say you should have a pramana okay to that is supporting evidence on what basis you are saying something okay and uh, in the indian darshan tradition uh, normally Uh, in some systems they add one or two more but normally all systems definitely agree that uh, um, uh, the, you know there are three uh, pramanas okay when i say all systems first of all i'm talking about vedic systems or what are called astika systems astika meaning those who believe uh, in the uh, primacy of vedas uh, it which has nothing to do with uh, believe in god by the way that there are uh, that, that is called uh, there are nirishwara or atheistic traditions within the vedic vedic traditions and there are theistic traditions in the vedic traditions uh, vedic uh, darshana so that is not the point uh, theism is many times people confuse astika as a theistic and nastika as a atheistic but actually in the way in the indian darshanic tradition astika means those who believe in the primacy of vedas and nastika means those who do not accept the primacy of vedas okay so now uh, in the astika tradition they that is uh, the they, they talk about six uh, traditions six darshanic traditions that they are called shad darshanas uh, that is the uh, vedanta and uh, you have um, sankhya you have yoga you have nyaya you have vaisheshika and you have puro mimamsa so these are the six traditions uh, vedanta is also sometimes called uttar mimamsa so but all these traditions 
uh, accept the the three pramanas, that three ways of verifying whether something is right or wrong. Now let's look at that. What are these? And they look uh, so um, uh, familiar to us in the uh, in in science. So that's why it's worth uh, looking at that. That the pramanas which darshanas talk about, that is one is called pratyaksha pramana, and Generally, it is considered that Pratyaksha Pramana is the highest form of Pramana, which means Pratyaksha means Anko Dekhi. Okay, I have seen it type of thing. Okay, that uh, or you can say I have observed it, that there is direct experience, direct, directly I have seen this happen. So, I will believe what I have seen, right? First, for me, that is the highest evidence. Then, um, so... When we say seen, see or pratyaksha, aksha means uh, eyes actually. Uh, so, uh, but it's it's in general all senses, okay? That is uh, touch and uh, the, well, what we see from five senses, eyes, nose, uh, ears, tongue, touch, that is skin, sparsha. So all these five senses that what we, that knowledge we get from these five senses, that is called pratyaksha. Or in modern uh, thing, we can we can call it empirical knowledge, okay? Direct empirical knowledge. Um, so which you can so if somebody makes a statement uh, that uh, you know it is uh, night right now, now you can just look out of the window and see whether it is night or it is day, or it is something in between. <laughs> it is a twilight, right? So this is the pratyaksha way of verifying whether somebody what somebody is saying or asserting. Is, uh, is right or wrong, uh, true or false, and so on. So this is considered the highest method, highest way. of. But many times, you may not be able to do this directly. Okay. So then what do you do? Uh, means you don't have direct knowledge of something. So then you think this looks, you know, there is this second level, level you can say, where um, it is, you cannot do direct observation. Uh, so, but from your previous experience and your previous knowledge of the world, you say that this is what must be happening there. Okay, this is what may be happening there. So it is, it is a, it is a. You can say it is speculative. But actually, it is not speculative because it is based on certain previous experience. For example, the most common example that is given is that of, uh, uh, you know, uh, seeing some smoke coming out of a forest, okay, far away, behind the hill. Some smoke is coming. Now, what is happening there if somebody asks? And most likely, <laughs> ordinary common sense will people will say oh there must be some fire there there may be some forest fire going on behind that right it's a very common but how did that conclude how did that person come to that conclusion that there may be fire there so this is called inference okay now inference means basically you think that if there is smoke there must be fire. Why? Because you have seen directly, previously, somewhere else, that fire and smoke together. Okay? That there was smoke and you found that actually below that smoke or behind that smoke there was fire. So now you are seeing smoke from a, at a distant point. So you think there must be some fire there. So this is called inference. Now in, in the in the in the Indian darshanic tradition, it is called anumana. Okay. Now um, this anumana um, is a you can say secondary knowledge, right? I mean you are not able to actually you neither have gone there and seen whether it is there is fire there or not. But from your previous experience, you have come to this conclusion, right? So it is you can you can say it is at a uh, when because you cannot do direct observation, you are ready to settle for a anumana. Now, some you know anumana normally in common language people think anumana means uh, doubt, 
uh, or anumana means guessing guessing also you know andaz lagana to andaz aisa ho sakta hai aisa hota hoga you know that type of thing but no anumana in the in the in the it is a technical word it is a purely technical word and uh, um, this is um, but how does the brain conclude this this is a interesting process now a person might just say oh that must be fire going out there okay now but how did that brain associate that smoke with that fire okay now people have at great length discuss this so anumana is one of the most hotly discussed topic in the, in the indian philosophical tradition um and particularly uh, it becomes the um basis of a uh, lot of discussion because uh, things which are not visible okay for example if somebody says there is atma or somebody says there is ishvara or somebody you know basically there are things which cannot see right but that person is asserting no ishvara exists or atma exists and so on so how do you how do you debate how do you try to prove it so since neither you can show it nor the other per person can see it so then you have you base your argument mostly on anumana inference so indirectly because of because this happens when that is there and that is what is happening here so this must be behind it okay so what is behind this experience ah that's it so so that is why this becomes very hotly contested nobody like argues about uh, pratyaksha okay direct experience uh, nobody argues about it because everybody can see it but those you are trying to prove things which others cannot see right so how do you argue with them so you have to you base yourself on very elaborate discussion of the anumana using the anumana okay um and uh, the third thing when uh, uh, let us say both cannot be used in proving something or accepting something as true then a third one is invoked and this is particularly true in all the astika darshanas which is called veda pramana saying that this exists in veda so it must be true why because those rishis for whom the veda was revealed because veda was according to the indian tradition veda is a purusheya means it is not written by anybody okay it is not written by human beings that it was revealed the vedic knowledge was revealed to certain rishis okay so it is a revelation to them so it is not even been authored by those rishis okay the the, the rishis are uh, explaining or um, uh, articulating their experience of that revelation in the in the vedic uh, tradition so uh, you say but um because those rishis are reliable sources and uh, so some some people also call this as aptavakya aptavakya means aptas are those people who will tell you as it is who who are who will tell you the truth okay so because such people have told me in whom i have faith because they'll tell me the truth they will not concoct something okay so uh, i believe uh, this to be true because i cannot prove it through either direct experience or i cannot prove it through anumana also so i i take this as the third uh, pramana so these three pramanas are commonly used by, uh, by in the indian tradition almost all the vedic traditions and even the when the discussions take place with the jains and uh, buddhists and uh, all that basic or even charvaka who is a, who is a vedic tradition but who did not uh, accept the primacy of vedas he is mentioned in the vedic traditions again and again and all the vedic traditions have to deal with them have to deal with charvaka statements and then say that why, why they uh, don't agree with it etc etc okay so they have to talk about what are the opposing views on this any any whenever they uh, putting forward their thesis they have to talk about what is the counter thesis and why that they think that is wrong okay Uh, and so on so they have to deal with charvaka all the uh, traditions have to deal with charvaka and uh, but there again they use they invoke they cannot with charvaka if they are arguing with charvaka for example they cannot say veda says this so it is true 
Because Charvaka doesn't accept Veda as Pramana. Okay. So then you have to talk to him on through about the direct experience. Then he will argue with you. Now, if you again another thing about Charvaka philosophy is that he does not accept Anumana. He does not accept Anumana as a, as a valid uh, Pramana. He thinks only Pratyaksha is the only valid Pramana. Okay. So you cannot even use Anumana to disprove him. Okay. Or uh, to argue with him. So you'll have to deal with him only on the basis of uh, uh, the, the Pratyaksha. So what what happens is not that on one phenomenon there are two different Pratyakshas, but you try to say that how Pratyaksha cannot be the only source of knowledge or it is not adequate that there are many, many cases where Pratyaksha doesn't apply, then you still, you come to certain conclusions and the life goes on. So, which means that sticking to only Pratyaksha is the only Pramana is an inadequate. So, this is what they try to show and then say that is why Charvaka is wrong. Okay, that is the way they argue with Charvaka. But with Jains and Buddhists, Buddhists I mean, uh, again, the same issue that they cannot use Veda Pramana to argue with them. So they have to deal with using Anumana and whether the other person accepts Anumana or not, in which cases they will accept Anumana. So this is, this is the kind of thing which goes on all the time. Now, if you look at, uh, let us take an everyday example. Now, somebody tells me, this is what happened in Russia or this is what is happening in Russia. Now, how do, how do I believe that? How do I think, you know, it's not in my direct experience. So on what basis I'll take that kind of a statement as true or not true. Since it's not in my direct experience, either like I have to believe in that person that he has a history of telling me the truth. Okay. So, it is, he is a reliable source. So, I think maybe it is true. Maybe what he's saying is true. Right. Or I say that this, this happened and this was the result. And in our case, whenever this result has been there, that was the cause. So the cause of two results must be the same. Because I know what cause led to what effect in my experience, in my country, in my direct experience. So if that is the effect that is going on there, then this must be the cause. Okay. It could be war, it could be inflation, it could be whatever. Okay. Something, some event it has happened. And you see how such things happen in your experience in your society then you say oh this what must be happening there also that's why uh, you know uh, uh, you know the, this how you do the guesswork again again you use uh, an indirect uh, experience uh, this is what is called anumana so in everyday uh, life we use this now i think um, you know, we are running out of time today so in the next episode we'll discuss um how science deals with with